Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to part three of the Cyber Risk Quantification Foundation's learning series, Building a Quantitative Risk Analysis Program from the Ground Up. I'm Lynn Todorov with HealthGuard, and I'll be your moderator for today's session. I have a couple of announcements and a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, in September, we're going to start a new series focused on HIPAA security. And this will be HSO 3.0, the evolving role of the HIPAA security officer. Um, in this three part series, we're going to explore the impact of regulation, healthcare practices, and technology, uh, looking at past, present, and future, and how it is evolving the role of the HIPAA security officer. You can check it out on our website and sign up, and I will put a link um, in the Zoom chat for everyone. As a reminder, we're recording today's learning event, and um, you will get the link by email, so you can rewatch it and share it with your friends and colleagues. When we send that email out, it'll also have your certificate of attendance and a link to any of the key resources um, from our talk today. And if you wouldn't mind, just take a minute and uh, locate the chat button on the Zoom controls at the bottom of the screen. And at any time during the discussion, if you think of a question, you can just type it in into the chat. So with that, we'll get started. Our speaker today um, is Apollonio, better known as Apps, Garcia. So Apps has 20 plus years of experience um, in healthcare, cybersecurity, and risk management, including teaching and helping hospital leaders uh, improve their risk reporting and decision-making uh, by applying quantitative risk analysis methods. Currently, Apps is the founder and CEO of HealthGuard, um, HealthGuard is a provider of enterprise and risk management software and services for hospitals. He's also served as the board president of the Society of Information Risk Analysts, CIRA, and has contributed to the Open Risk Quantification Standards and Guidelines at the Open Group, um, which is an international open standards body. Apps is also a decorated veteran of the U.S. Navy, a husband, and a father of two. With that... Apps, it's all you. Thanks, Lynn, and, and welcome again, everyone. As Lynn mentioned, this is uh, part three of this cyber risk quantification mini series. Uh, in part one, we introduced some of the fundamentals of CRQ and the value it provides. So that was kind of a foundational uh, session. In part two, we introduce a new framework for deciding when you should perform cyber risk quantification, uh, understanding that uh, it's nearly impossible, if not impossible, to analyze every risk that you face. Uh, you, most organizations don't have the resources and, and even automation doesn't cover everything. Um, in this session, we're gonna share some ideas on how to build uh, a quantitative risk analysis capability in your organization. And it's really based on our decade plus uh, experience working with customers. And uh, you know, by no means is it going to be exhaustive or, or is it gonna be, do we, do we claim to know every tip and trick or do we claim to, to have the perfect solution? But you'll, you'll, as you, I think you'll learn, uh, we, we take somewhat of a strategic approach to it. Uh, and, and that's what I would encourage you, uh, as, you as you're going through this, and, and if you're on your journey, regardless of where you're at, is to think strategically about um, about how, how you approach this versus just buying a tool or, or you know, building a simple process. Think, think broader, think more strategically about it. And so uh, today, what we'll be going over is, is, as you see on the screen, really is to, to clarify uh, objective setting. And, and again, this is part of the strategic process is being clear on, and, on what your objective is uh, on, on this journey, uh, then development of a strategy to achieve the objective. And then finally, some suggestions on how to execute your strategy. Uh, and so, so again, this is, this is going to be the, the, outline of, of the discussion for today. 
uh, and and really the, the goal is to to help you be successful uh, with building uh, again a, a quantitative risk analysis process. But I would suggest that you know regardless of of what it is, the same approach would would probably uh, uh, hold water for you. So with that, um, you know the first thing we need to do is again clearly find the uh, define the objective. Because one thing that we've seen in working with customers in all sorts of different projects, often, uh, and this is just business in general, often we're not really clear on what the gold line is, right? We don't always upfront decide what does done look like or, or what is the end game here that we're trying to achieve. And if you spend some time clarifying that upfront, it makes things a lot easier. It kind of gives you and the, and the, uh, the organization a true north of where are we going? Regardless of how we get there, where, where do we want to be when this is all said and done? How do we define success, et cetera? So, so, so being clear on the objective is, is, is the first part. Um, we, we are big fans of ISO 31000. Uh, so, so this is the uh, uh, risk management process from ISO 31000. And as you see, uh, within the risk management process, risk analysis itself is part of the bigger risk assessment process. And this is... You know, terminology wise, some people conflate risk analysis with risk assessment. We like to use their definitions because it brings clarity. Uh, the risk assessment process includes risk identification, or as we call it, turning over the rocks. Then finally, as you identify risk, doing some kind of decomposition and analysis of that risk to estimate what's the, you know, the, the, the tried and true formula, what's the probability that that is going to materialize. And then if it materializes, how bad is it going to be? And then evaluating that against your criteria, whether it be some kind of risk appetite or whether it be uh, some criteria to determine, do we need more information to make a decision? Uh, and then finally, down below uh, is risk treatment, which is where you're actually taking action to either transfer, mitigate, accept, or avoid the risk, right? So so the bottom line here, though, is, is when we're talking about cyber risk quantification, we're talking about really that middle part of the broader risk management process. And that's important. To, to, to be clear about, right? What, what are we actually dealing with here? And, and we're not gonna go too far into this because we've discussed this in, in some of the other sessions and, and, and the many talks and articles that we've published, but this is a healthcare specific guideline uh, from HHS that they released a few years ago that really just kind of reinforces the value that cyber risk quantification brings to the table versus other traditional qualitative or semi-qualitative methods uh, that, that a lot of organizations use. Uh, and, and as you see here on the screen, uh, you know, some of the, the, the challenges with using qualitative methods, according to HHS, and, and just to a larger degree, you know, our experience as well, is that overly subjective, uh, they, they tend to lack transparency because you're trying to distill a, um, a very complex issue into a single number or color um, uh, the, the ratings are sometimes uninformative, meaning that, you know, if, if you have a risk of a 10 or a risk of a 25, what is that really telling you? What is that really telling the decision maker? Now you could say there's value in rank ordering risk, you know, a 20 versus a 25. And, and that's true, but, but the, with those traditional qualitative methods, the, the way you get there is often suspect. And I would say, I would argue that it's almost always suspect. Uh, so, so there, there's some challenges in, um, in, in, in the traditional methods that, you know, as you, you see to the right there, the quantitative approach addresses where it's transparent, where you can, you can share your assumptions and rationale and even the math on how you got to, to your estimation of risk. Uh, it's repeatable if you have a consistent method and, and process around it. It's scalable in that you can take it. Um, and apply it to not only cyber, you can apply it to you know, other domains of risk that the organization may have, and it's reproducible. If, if you're able to share the math and you're able to show the process and thinking behind it, and you have a standardized approach, uh, you can you can reproduce it. So, but ultimately, uh, you know, when it, when, it, when it boils down to it, you know, the, the reason we do this, and, and I'll say this probably more than once during this talk, is to, the reason we do analysis is to inform decision-making. So, so the question we should always be asking ourselves is, you know, what decision are we making and, and how does the information we're providing that individual or committee or whoever's making the decision, how, do, how, do, how does the information we're providing improve the decision making? 
in order to improve outcomes, right? So, so that's that should always be kind of the litmus test that we are gauging our risk analysis by. In addition to, you know, is this compliant with with whatever regulation, including HIPAA, that we have to uh, to meet? So, so again, this is the uh, the overarching kind of you know reason on on why. You know, we should consider quantitative analysis. And again, if, if you are interested, uh, some of the other videos that there are recordings of uh, the, this webinar series, we, we kind of dig into this a little bit more. Now, one of, one of the uh, dirty, not so secrets uh, around healthcare specifically is that, you know, according to you know, HIPAA report, and, and you know, I'm sure these numbers have changed a little bit, but I doubt that they've changed a lot. Um, is that you know a, a majority, overwhelming majority of organizations are failing to meet the basic requirements for risk analysis and risk management, uh, and, and so you know I'm assuming that that uh, you know some of you here may fall either partially or entirely into these stats, right, into these metrics, uh, whereby um, you know our risk analysis uh, processes and our risk management programs. Uh, leaves a little something to be desired, and it, you know, and I, I would argue there's always room for improvement, no matter how good you are. Um, but uh, but in, in this case, this is saying that you know there's there's a large group of of organizations, covered entities, um, that that are that are failing just to meet the basic requirements for HIPAA. Uh, so so this is you know part of the problem space that uh, overall overall what they were trying to address is to so how do we how do we help organizations. Um, uh, do risk analysis and risk management uh, in a more effective way that, that checks the box, right? That, that meets the requirements, but also, again, delivers business value to their organizations. We don't want to do compliance exercise just for the sake of compliance. We want to squeeze as much value out of, out of this effort as we can. And again, and, you know, as I said before, risk analysis is, is really there to, to help inform decisions. So, so this is an example of an objective, right? And, and, and I would assume um, you know, this type of objective would would a uh, would be something relevant uh, to to most of us. Um, you know, the one thing that's not here is part of the objective that would may make it a little tighter is is having some kind of date, right? By when? Uh, but you know, with with that being said, having a HIPAA compliant risk management programs that includes risk analysis, which improves decision making and leads to better outcomes. In this case, you know, in this objective, you know, for, as for the example, we specifically didn't say quantification uh, because we, you know, as we said before, quantification is required in order to improve decision making uh, that lead to better outcomes. So, so that's kind of buried in there. But if you wanted to, you could, you know, you could say includes a quantitative risk analysis process. But, you know, we, we don't, we don't personally, I don't think that's necessary. But again, that's this is. Uh, more of a stylistic uh, thing and, and what's what you would be comfortable with. Uh, but again, this is just being clear on where are we going? What are we trying to achieve with this process and this program? Uh, because as, as I'm sure most of you understand and, and are aware, um, you know, building a new process, including risk analysis, uh, is, is not a simple endeavor. It takes time and energy to, to, to build a program uh, both risk management and risk analysis and, and get, you know, the, the, the appropriate folks uh, to, to uh, use it and to consistently perform it, which goes back to the previous slide I showed on, on the stats in healthcare, right? That the poor stats of, of HIPAA compliance for risk management and the risk analysis standards. Uh, so with that, you know, one of the, the, um, um, challenges that we face uh, are just the overall failure rate of initiatives and organizations, right? So if you, if you look at a couple of, of stats here, um, you know, one from Gartner that you know, a quarter of all IT projects fail, fail to deliver the business objectives or value that, that uh, they intend at the beginning. Uh, so, so that's, that's pretty startling, but even more startling is at, at a, even a more macro level, that according to McKinsey, 70% uh, of all business transformations fail, right? So, so again, thinking strategically about this, as, as you think about building a process, a program, a um, project, if you will, uh, to implement 
quantitative risk analysis or risk management at large, you know, the odds are against you. So, so again, uh, you know, I implore us to think strategically about this uh, and, and how can we improve the odds for ourselves? How can, how can we uh, improve the odds that we're going to be successful in delivering business value? Uh, and that's, again, that's what we're here to talk about today. So, so in order to achieve the objective, um, you know, we, we now delve into kind of the strategy. And, and this is really just, you know, high level, how are we going to, to, to get to our goal, right? How are we going to achieve the objective that we laid out? Um, and so, you know, we, we're big fans of the simple crawl, walk, run, right? Let's, let's not try to boil the ocean at once. Let's start small, get some wins, and, and, and build from there. Find out what's successful, what's not successful, et cetera. And the, and the way we tend to do this and think about this is across the tried and true three-legged stool of, of, of solutions, right? The people process tools. And so I want to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about each one of these legs or dimensions uh, and, and give us some ideas on, on, uh, on, on what we should be thinking about for each. So, so first, I'm going to pause, though. Any questions so far? Any thoughts on what we've covered? All right, hearing none. And Lynn, I'm assuming you'll chime in if there's something pressing. Um, so as far as the strategy, the first is the people side of things. And, and, and a lot of this is going to be, you know, what we've, we understand uh, and we know, but sometimes we don't always execute on it. The first one is, is, you know, finding champions, right? So, so who in the organization would get behind a initiative uh, and, and, and helping us achieve our objective, right? In this case, if it's cyber risk quantification, who are some folks that would, uh, you know, get behind it and, and support it, especially at the executive level? So, so maybe there's a chief information security officer, maybe there's a CIO, uh, maybe there's an internal audit uh, director or VP uh, or an enterprise risk uh, organization, uh, but, but it's going to be those organizations or those individuals that, um, you know, they may not fully understand it. They may not, you know, know how to do it. Uh, but it, but if you build the case and you explain what you're trying to do and how you're going to get there, uh, they, they will, you know, get behind you and say, yep, in, in meetings and in, in board presentations or whatever the case may be, they're willing to stack hands. And at the very least, they're not going to be detractors, right? Because that's what, that's the one thing that you need to do early on is find, those people who may actually, um, and for lack of a better term, for whatever reason, may be either threatened or by, they, they may, for some reason, subvert the process uh, or, or may, may not think it's a priority or whatever the case may be. So, so uh, you know, that first item there is finding champions and, and finding those who may, may not champion it is, is important to do, right? So, so, so find out uh, who, who, who you're, who your supporters are going to be and those who may not support it. Um, and, and that may feel political and, and I guess it is, uh, but, but it, but in, in any initiative like this, where you're trying to change the organization or change, you know, regardless of how small you're trying to have an impact on how the organization does business, it's important to flesh that out. Uh, the second thing is to identify the analysts, right? So who is actually going to be doing the work? <laughs> And, and I could tell you, if, if you think you can just pull some experienced cybersecurity practitioner or even some risk practitioner or auditor and just throw them into risk quantification and give them a book and say, go, I, that's not the case. There, there's, a, there's skills that you need to have. There's knowledge, that foundational knowledge that you need to have uh, in order to do this effectively. Uh, and, 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 you know, there's training and, and there's definitely reading and there's, you know, support for this. Uh, but but I, I, I would definitely encourage you to think strategically about even if, if it's on the crawl phase, you're doing a small experiment, understand who's going to do the work, whether it be an internal employee or, or outsourcing or partnering with someone to help you with that initial phase. Um, and, and the third one, which is critical, is determining who's going to use the output. One, one thing I've, I've seen organizations do over the years um, is not be clear on the decisions being made or, or what de decisions do you want to help in, uh, inform with the analysis 
and and what information do those individual stakeholders need and 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 how do they like to consume information uh and, and i was just in in boston this week uh, at at Syracon, uh, which again is the annual conference for Society of Information Risk Analysts. Uh, and, and I ha was having a conversation with a gentleman by the name of Tony Varton, Martin Veggie, who's a, an amazing risk uh, practitioner who works for Netflix. Um, and and we, 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 for about 45 minutes, we just talked about, uh, you know, the, the, the need around understanding how to present the information to those that are the consumers of it, right? The people that are making decisions or the people that need to support or whatever the case may be, um, uh, you know, making sure that if, if they're a, a visual person uh, and, you know, they want graphs and charts, they give them that. If there are people that just like a, you know, a simple, just give me the, the bottom line type of number type of person, you know, making sure you're presenting that, or if there's someone who likes to, to get into the weeds and the detail and like to see all the, the, uh, uh, the minutia, then yeah, give them that, right? So, so understanding uh, you know, who's going to actually use the information for decision making, uh, and 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 you know, if you can't do it up front, iterating towards giving it to them, All right? So that that's that's valuable because there's nothing worse than uh, than, than doing a bunch of work and providing a report that, that may be an amazing analysis, but they don't use it. I mean, that, that is a horrible feeling is, is if you do a bunch of work and they're not even, you know, they don't even care. Uh, so, so again, um, I can't encourage you enough if you're going down this journey or when you start this journey, making sure that you understand who uh, the, the, the uh, decision maker is or consumer of your, your information, your report uh, analysis is and, uh, and, 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 and starting to work towards, um, you know, meeting them where they, where they are. Um, the next leg of the stool is the triage process, uh, and and uh, or the process, uh, and, and it's part of it has two parts uh, from from this perspective is triage and analysis. So uh, so as we know, you know that you have lots of risks coming in 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 the door uh, if for a risk team. Uh, there's lots of issues that come from audits and and assessments and pen tests and you know all the various sources of of risk information. And so the triage process is simply allowing us to quickly and efficiently prioritize and categorize the risk. And, and ultimately what we're trying to do there is decide which issues should be analyzed, which issues warrant analysis, and, and also which issues should be addressed first, right? Because not all issues are created equal. Some issues need immediate action. Some issues need, you know, may need analysis. To, to determine exactly how big and bad they are. And some issues can be set aside, deferred, uh, and, and addressed later when you have more resources or time. Uh, but ultimately, the triage process, again, is, is about quickly prioritizing the, the type of issue it is, categorizing it into some bucket uh, of, of the type and, and scope and scale uh, and then also to, again, decide which ones are we going to ana analyze first um, or at all. And, 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 and the, one of the previous webinars we gave, we, we again shared the framework on uh, a framework using uh, a methodology or a frame, another framework called Kinevin to help us uh, flesh out which, which issues should we actually be investing time and energy to do quantitative analysis on. Uh, the, the, the second item down there is the analysis process itself, which is you know, developing whichever risk scenarios you need to develop, uh, decomposing those scenarios, develop, you know, using a model uh, like FAIR or, or what other, other model you're going to use, and then um, you know, doing reporting. And you know, that whole process takes time and energy. Um, I'm not going to pretend it doesn't. Uh, but but it's also important that that uh, you know you have again going back to the people uh, leg of the stool uh, you you know who's going to do it and they have the right knowledge and skills to be able to 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 carry that out uh, so so that is that is the uh, you know second part of the strategy the process uh, and and finally uh, on the tools leg of the stool. Uh, we kind of talk through talk to three different areas. One is documentation. You know, we're big fans of process maps. 
uh, like you see over there to the right. But, but being clear on what is the process, and, and this is with usually going to be in the larger context of the risk management process, how is how are issues coming into uh, to the to the to the team or to the group or to the individual that's going to be doing the analysis? Uh, what is the analysis process? This the key steps that they're going to take. What does that reporting look like? How do you iterate through that? Uh, what is the decision making process, et cetera? So, so we're again, I can't encourage you enough. If you don't already do process maps, I would I would encourage you to take a look at that. Um, the second item there is RACES. Uh, and, and really, if you're not familiar with RACES, I think most of us probably are, but really it's just about, about being clear on roles and responsibilities. Who's going to do what and, and what are their roles in the process? Are, are they responsible? Are they accountable? Are they, are they someone who's just supporting the process? Are they being consulted? Are they, are, we just, are they just being informed? So having you know, a RACI chart, uh, especially early on, is, is invaluable as, as you're uh, you know, building out your, your process. And then finally, on the documentation is, is having guides, you know, whether it be for the, the analyst uh, or, or tip sheets. And this is actually something that came from one of our customers where we provided a report uh, and their, their uh, chief digital officer, uh, CIO, um, said, hey, you know, some of the couple of these items here may not be, uh, you know, clear or, or at least the first time, you know, whoever on the team is going to be reviewing the report, they may not understand it clearly. Uh, what, what is a loss exceedance curve or what is, you know, whatever the case may be, whatever part of the report is. So providing a tip sheet on how to interpret and use the information we're providing in the report um, is something that you may want to do. Uh, so, so, you know, we love that idea and we've kind of adopted it as, as something that we want to uh, use uh, ongoing. So, so again, just some some good documentation is is a, is a key part of your toolkit. Uh, the the other is the risk management workflow itself. So, so uh, you know you can use your own GRC solution, or or you know you could use a homegrown solution that's combined from combined of spreadsheets. Uh, Word documents, obviously, we're big fans of our platform, Decipher Risk. But overall, the 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 idea is that you have a way to ingest issues, uh, again, decide if you're going to analyze them, analyze them, and then manage the risk treatment or risk mitigation uh, activity afterwards. Uh, so so having, having that whole workflow um, in place and documented is, is valuable. And then finally, uh, the risk analysis process itself uh, which is where we get into the risk quantification, uh, you can use uh, a variety of tools. And, and, and I'll, I'll just generically say uh, you, you, you're going to want to use something that does Monte Carlo simulation. If you're not familiar with that, I would encourage you to, to take, a, take a look at our, our intro uh, webinar on this series, this mini series. Um, but um, but possibly, you know, bottom line is we have a free basic risk calculator that you can download as, as an example of, of a tool that you could use for simple analysis. And, and of course, again, we've got our platform, but there's many other platforms that, uh, that do the same type of thing where you're doing risk quantification of, of, of some sort. Uh, so, so again, this is just a flavor of, of the type of tools that you will want to, to think about. And, um, um, and, and I would have you strongly, strongly encourage you to, to, uh, to utilize when you're, when you're going down the journey. Um, the, 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 last part of the strategy is is to consider your options and and you know we we're, we're describing here three high level option which is build buy and rent uh so in in the build which is where you go you decide to build it all in house so on the people side you're going to hire train and, and retain your staff and then i could tell you for smaller shops uh that that this can be a challenge to to you know build a a uh, a team and have enough bench strength to to be able to do it. Uh, one thing that we've seen and 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 we've heard this from even some of our our competitors in in the quant space uh, is that you know you'll build a team, organizations will build a team, and those individuals uh, you know within a year, less than two years for sure, are often recruited and hired away. So so you 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 spend all this time building this capability in house and 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 getting your 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 team uh, staffed and or only to be cherry picked uh, by by a competitor. So 
So this is is something you you want to um, you know think about. Uh, the second one is process, right? So how do you who's going to help you build your process? And, and again, you could do that with staff or consultants um, and on a project basis. And the tools itself, you can you know you can choose to build your own, right? Well, there are organizations, large organizations, you know, Fortune 10 organizations that have the resources to uh, to build their own modeling tools and processes. Uh, so, so that's one consideration. The second one is, you know, the buy, which is, um, you know, similar to the first, except that instead of building your own tools, you're purchasing something off the shelf, right? So, uh, you know, again, Decipher Risk, which is our solution, but, you know, there's other products that you could buy off the shelf. Uh, but m much of it is, is, you know, similar to, uh, to, to the build. And finally, the rent version here, uh, the rent option is where, where you're simply uh, outsourcing or co-sourcing, you know, sharing responsibility with a partner. Uh, and, and, and often this will include um, them bringing together the processes and the tools and that, you know, being part of the implementation. Uh, and if it's not obvious, that's, you know, we can help you uh, with all three of these, that's that's what uh, HealthGuard does. We can help you with build, buy, or rent, uh, regardless of what the option is. Uh, so, the final item here is execution, and and this is um, I, I will say it's somewhat straightforward. Um, but again, if if you go back to this, the overall strategy that that we discussed, which is crawl, walk, run. Um, I would I would again encourage you to uh, crawl before you try to walk or run, and and we're big fans of the uh, PDCA model, uh, which is which you know kind of aligns with agile uh, agile development, and, and and the idea here really is is you know start small and think um, th think almost like a, a scientist in that you're going to do a small experiment. Uh, and and see what the results are, uh, and 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 then from there uh, adapt and iterate and 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 you know proceed, uh, and in some cases decide if you want to proceed. Uh, and, and when I say small experiment, I'm really referring to something that is low cost, low risk in in, in relation to you know bigger changes. So so again, going back to the notion that a lot of change initiatives fail. Um, you know, we, we want to guard against that. Uh, we want to we want to be careful. I, I I would suggest to to um, not try to boil the ocean and and again think think small up front. So as we go through a planning process uh, and and deciding where we want to go, um, it, it may be hey we want to um, identify one or two or three use cases or or types of decisions uh, and types of risks that we want to run through this process. We don't want to. We don't want to try to, you know, implement a a, a wide-reaching, uh, enterprise-wide uh, change or or solution. We want to start small, uh, and then as you carry that out and you do, you you know you deliver reporting to decision makers, you identify, you know, what uh, what information they like, what information they don't like, whether or not they even think it's valuable, uh, whether or not they're using it in their decision making. Um, that is that would be part of the check process, and then finally, the act process is 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 making whatever change based on the feedback you got, and then going through the cycle again. And this may include you know going through a couple of iterations on the same use case, or it may include uh, expanding the adoption or usage uh, and changing use cases, increasing the number of use cases and decisions that you're trying to inform. Uh, but but again, uh, this is a tried and true. Uh, process and, and and over the years, you know, we, we've kind of migrated from okay, we're going to try to, <clears throat> you know, ch uh, implement a, a organization wide change to okay, let's do small scale, uh, low risk, uh, high value type of experiments. This this is a uh, you know worked worked well for us. <clears throat> and finally. Uh, we'll, we'll leave you with a couple of, of what we're calling pro tips or, or, or ideas here. Uh, the first one is, is you know, uh, playing off of uh, the old Clinton 
um, advisor, campaign advisor, James Carvel, James Carvel, uh, you know, and where he wrote on the board, famously wrote on the whiteboard, it's about the economy, stupid, to his campaign team. In this case, we're just, you know, tongue in cheek, we're reminding you it's about the decision. Um, uh, so, so, so always keep that in mind is, you know, what, why are, the reason we're doing analysis is, is to, to inform decisions. Um, and so always circling back to what decision and who's making that decision, how are they making the decision? Um, and, and how do we help them make that decision more effectively? Uh, the other pro tip is there's no one size fits all. And, and this goes back to the PDCA um, and, and experimentation kind of mindset where, you know, every organization um, is is unique in terms of their maturity for, around risk management, their understanding of terminology, their their usage of data and information for decision making, um, their 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 interest in quantum. I mean, every every organization is 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 unique. So so as you're going through the process, uh, you know, in, in embracing that 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 experimentation mindset uh, that we're talking about, and and uh, you know, being being patient and iterating through through, through um, uh, you know, the cycle, the PDC, P PDCA cycle a few times. Uh, the, third, the third pro tip is to listen to your customer. And in this case, it's the customer of the risk analysis. So whoever the person is that is gonna be consuming the information, the output of the analysis uh, and, and deciding um, and understanding I should say, what information do they need and what format do they need it again, need it in, uh, that, that is key. And whatever feedback they give you is, is, is valuable. Don't take it as, as, as insults or, or an attack <laughs> on the quality of your work. Um, you know, take it as, as, you know, feedback is, is amazingly valuable. Uh, the, the fourth item there is emphasize continuous learning and iteration. And, and that is, you know, candidly, that's what we talk about with our customers up front. Hey, we're going to learn and, and iterate through this process together. Uh, we're going to understand what people need and, and meet them where they are. Uh, and, and again, some people may be, yeah, they get it right away and some people may not. Uh, and, and so as long as you, you, you explain up front that, hey, we're going to um, be using a iterative, continuous improvement type of mindset, and, and we're going to learn and, and adapt as necessary and, and build a, a right size solution for the organization, then, then you know, people uh, have, have tended to be more open to that, that you're not coming in and telling them this is, you know, this is how it is. And, and I'm going to give you a report and it's going to be in this format and you're just going to like it, uh, that, that you know, more, much more of a um, uh, adaptive and, 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 you know, partnering type of approach. And then finally, using qualitative and quantitative feedback, I, I can't, or, or encourage this enough uh, that that as, as you're going through the process, uh, you're doing analysis and 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 you know talking to to people as part of your analysis process, and you're delivering the 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 results of the analysis. I, I would be getting feedback throughout that, understanding what works for people, what people like, what people don't like, uh, and and um, you know and really ultimately what's of value to them. Because I said before, if you, you know, you do a bunch of work, you deliver a report and it misses the mark, you want, you should want to know that so that you could adjust versus have people just say, okay, we did that. It, it, you know, candidly, it sucked or I didn't get value out of it. We're done. Uh, you, you don't want that to happen. You want to, you want to get the feedback and figure out how can you adjust to again meet them where they are and, and provide something that's of value. Uh, and, and we can't assume. I don't care how smart you are, or or you know how 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 polished the tools you have are. Um, we can't assume that we know every everything, uh, and and that uh, you know we we have to we have to kind of walk a mile in in the shoes of of our customer and understand where they're coming from and and what they need uh, to do their job. So, um, so so there are, those are our pro tips. Uh, with that. Ready for Q&A? Yeah, apps. Um, at this time, I don't see any questions in the in the chat. Um, we can offer up if anybody has a question that they want to ask us. Um, one thing you did mention, though, earlier, and uh, this may be helpful, you were talking about ISO 31000. If you could just uh, let folks know where they can get a little more information on that. Yeah, so uh, ISO 31000, um, 
is a international, well, ISO is an international standards body. Uh, the guidelines are uh, available, and, and there is a small fee if, if you want to purchase the guidelines themselves. Uh, if you go to our blog, there, there's a few different uh, resources there um, that are, that's free, obviously. But if you want the actual guidelines, and they, they even have a supplemental practice guide that, that gets into more, uh, um, you know, how to apply it, best practices, et cetera. Uh, it's, it's only a couple hundred dollars, I think, for the, you purchase it from ISO or one of their uh, domestic partners. ANSI, I think, is a domestic partner. Uh, but if you just Google ISO 31000, uh, you, you should be able to find it. Lynn, I would also ask uh, that uh, if, you, if people have a, a um, smartphone handy, uh, if you could snap a quick picture of this QR code and uh, and, and give us feedback. We, we love feedback uh, on these to make sure they're delivering value. Um, and, and, and again, if someone wants to have a follow-up conversation, you, have, you can do that there as well. Uh, you can also go to that the URL, URL uh, the link down below. It's the same thing. Um, so, so please, uh, please provide feedback. Well, I say if there are no more questions, uh, we can go ahead and start wrapping up and give everybody back a little bit of time. Um, thank you apps, uh, for that, all that information. That was a, a fantastic presentation. Um, just a reminder to everybody that we do have a new series starting. It's the HIPAA Security Series HSO 3.0, the evolving role of the HIPAA Security Officer. Um, you can always reach out to us through email or LinkedIn um, or visit our website to register for the events. Or if you want to learn more about our learning opportunities that we offer uh, through HealthGuard University. So thanks again. We really appreciate you spending time with us and we will see you next time.